Ringling Brothers and Barnum and Bailey says its final farewell. Experience the spectacle. Behold the wonder. Witness the greatest show on earth. One last time. The final show of Ringling Brothers and Barnum and Bailey Circus is today. It is at 7 p.m. in New York at Nassau Coliseum. Um, so if you want to make it, you know, it's about 11 o'clock right now. Um, it's at 7 p.m. Eastern time. I see Becky's probably getting out of here so she can get there. Um, you know, so you got, okay, 7 p.m. That's four. You have about five hours. What is it? Three and a half, four hour flight to New York. So get going now. Because if you ever want to go see the Ringling Brothers, Barnum and Bailey Circus ever again, like this is your very last chance. Um, and to be honest, I think that's kind of sad to think about. Um, because when I was little, I remember going to the circus a few times as a kid. And I thought it was pretty great. Um, you had a lion tamer, magic show, motorcycle stunts, a human cannonball, trapeze artists, and the tightrope act. You know, I mean, the circus, like that's like the one time you enjoy seeing a clown. Um, maybe, but better odds. And, and best of all, at any circus are the elephants. Now, of course, as a child, I had no idea that the circus is a terrible place for an elephant. Um, but you know what they say about ignorance and bliss. Now, though, if you, if you want to take your kids to the circus after today, I mean, what, is Cirque du Soleil your only option anymore? And I don't want to bash on Cirque du Soleil. I am sure that if I went to a show now that I'd really enjoy it. Um, but my parents took me, took me to that circus when I was a kid, and it was awful. I hated it. I mean, it was just weird and had, like, it was my, I don't know, like, if a kid has to choose between a weird esoteric French circuit with headless men and mimes or, you know, a flashy circus with lions and tigers and a guy being shot across the arena, I mean, I don't know what kid is picking the former. The circus is fun and it's imaginative. You know, it felt like a place for anyone, misfits and strongmen, acrobats and clowns. Maybe that's the reason behind that classic kid threat about running away to join the circus. Did any of you, anybody ever threaten to tell your parents you're gonna run away to join the circus? It's one of those things where it's, everyone does it, but it's only in like shows, but you know, that classic threat. I'm running away to join the circus, but now what? Like wh where's Roland gonna run away to? He can't go join the circus. When, or right now he's scooting away, but case in point, he ain't joining the circus. So this summer, since we can no longer go to the circus, we're gonna bring the circus here as we explore the book of Judges. We're gonna look at, um, how, look through these Judges, and, and honestly, how Judges is like the circus might be lost on most of you. But as we look at the many different characters that are called to be Judges and leaders of Israel, we'll encounter many men and one woman who, honestly, seem to fit better at a circus than in the Bible. We'll have clowns and strong men, magic acts and sword swallowers. We'll meet misfits who would seem like the last choice to lead an army or to carry out God's calling. Yet, despite everything, the Bible is exactly where we will find them. So we're going to take the time to explore judges and we're gonna meet the people that God calls and we may just find ourselves in them. Perhaps we too don't feel equipped to what we think God is leading us to do. We really, we think that we really should be his last choice, not his first. Clearly, there is someone else who is better suited for the task. Or maybe we're too confident. You know, we, we, are, we were proud of our gifts and we knew our strengths. I mean, we were better than everyone and we knew it. And our strengths ended up being our downfall. Why would God want anything to do with us after such complete failure? Or are we afraid of failure? We hear God leading us to a new job, a new promotion with leadership responsibilities or a new relationship and commitment, but we're afraid of the task. We're afraid that we aren't up for it. We don't wanna go it alone, so in our fear, we make a bargain that we can't keep. Or maybe we just need to admit that sometimes our success isn't our own and instead humbly give credit to God. 
So as we explore Judges the rest of the summer, we are going to encounter many broken and fallen characters. Each week we'll explore a different judge and we're gonna dive into these stories of the unequipped, the failure, the fearful, and more. We'll see that they don't always do the right thing and we shouldn't always seek to emulate them. That's the tension of judges and narrative books like it. Just because it's in the Bible doesn't mean that the supposed hero, the called or chosen, does the right thing. But in that brokenness, we can find ourselves. And we remember that the real heroes are not us. It's not these characters, but God. So let's step into this book full of circus acts. But before we get to our sword swallower, we need to set the stage. And we need to ask, how did we come to a place where God repeatedly calls upon such a band of misfits? Well, Judges begins with the death of Joshua, the leader of the Israelites after Moses. Moses led them out of slavery in Egypt to just outside the promised land, leaving Joshua to take over, leading them into the land and driving out those who currently reside in the country set aside by God for his people. Joshua died before the job was done. He died before everyone was driven out. So he left the Israelites with a careful message. You have seen everything the Lord your God has done for you during my lifetime. The Lord your God has fought for you against your enemies. I have allotted to you as your homeland all the land of the nations yet unconquered, as well as the land of those we have already conquered, from the Jordan River to the Mediterranean Sea in the west. The land will be yours, for the Lord your God will himself drive out all the people living there now. You will take possession of their land, just as the Lord your God promised you. He reminds them with confidence. God will not abandon them before the task is done, just as long as they stay true to God. He warns them of the consequences if they don't drive everyone out of the land. Make sure that you do not associate with the other people still remaining in the land. Do not even mention the names of their gods, much less swear by them or serve them or worship them. Rather, cling tightly to the Lord your God as you have done until now. For the Lord has driven out great and powerful nations for you, and no one has yet been able to defeat you. But if you turn away from him and you cling to the customs of the survivors of these nations remaining among you, and if you intermarry with them, then know for certain that the Lord your God will no longer drive them out of your land. Instead, they will be a snare and a trap for you a whip to your backs and 30 brambles in your eyes, and you will vanish from this good land the Lord your God has given you. Completely conquer the land, lest the remaining people sway you from following God, who has taken care of you all the way across the desert from Egypt, and he will continue to bless you. Very simple, very clear directions. And the Israelites follow them for all of 17 verses. The tribes of Judah and Simeon, they succeed in completely driving out the Canaanites and the Perizzites in their territory. Um, but then the rest of the troops fail, all the rest of the tribes, they fail to follow suit. The tribe of Benjamin, however, failed to drive out the Jebusites who were living in Jerusalem. The tribe of Manasseh failed to drive out the people living in Bethshan, Tanakh, Dor, Iblium, Megiddo, and all their surrounding settlements. The tribe of Ephraim failed to drive out the Canaanites living in Gezer. So the Canaanites continue to live there among them. And so it repeats for Zebulun, Asher, Naphtali, and Dan. They all fail to drive out those who live in their allotted territory of the promised land. And instead, they just end up living with them. What happened to God's promise that he would drive out everyone from the promised land, totally delivering it to the Israelites? Well, in chapter two, we are told, the angel of the Lord went from Gilgal to Bokim. And said to the Israelites, I brought you out of Egypt in this, into this land that I swore to give your ancestors. And I said, I would never break my covenant with you. For your part, you were not to make any covenants with the people living in the land. Instead, you were to destroy their altars. But you disobeyed my command. Why did you do this? So now I declare that I will no longer drive out the people living in your land. They will be thorns in your sides and their gods will be a constant temptation to you. The Israelites failed to follow God and Joshua's one command. God promised to drive out everyone from the land through the Israelites, but the Israelites stopped short. 
They started making bargains with the Canaanites and the other people in the land. They didn't destroy the pagan idols, and they instead began to worship other gods. They disobeyed God, and they broke the covenant. The failure to drive their enemies from the promised land is not God's failure, but theirs. God wanted them to live set apart, free from the influence of, a, of the world, a world which saw child sacrifice and prostitution as forms of worship. But instead, the Israelites lived with and among their enemies. Then, after that generation died, another generation grew up, who did not acknowledge the Lord or remember the mighty things he had done for Israel. The Israelites did evil in the Lord's sight, and they served the images of Baal. They abandoned the Lord, the God of their ancestors, who had brought them out of Egypt. They went after other gods, worshiping the gods of the people around them, and they angered the Lord. This disobedience sets the stage for judges. Think of this as the first ring of our three ring circus. It's the stage where all of our circus acts perform and the context for their stories. And the first ring is Israel disobeys God. Israel sins and Israel falls away from God. They begin to worship idols and turn to the ways of their enemies the ways of the world rather than the ways of God. Rather than living set apart, they live the same lives that God is trying to steer them away from. And there are consequences. The Lord turned them over to their enemies all around and they were no longer able to resist them. And the people were in great distress. And so the second ring is Israel is turned over to their enemies. Foreign kings come in and they conquer them. They enslave them or oppress the Israelites. God's people suffer and in their suffering, they turn back to God and they cry out. They repent and God hears them. Then the Lord raised up judges to rescue the Israelites from their attackers. And this is the third ring of our circus. God rescues his people. He raises up a deliverer and a judge and he frees his people. And then the cycle repeats. Whenever the Lord raised up a judge over Israel, he was with that judge and he rescued the people from their enemies throughout the judge's lifetime. For the Lord took pity on his people who were burdened by oppression and suffering. But when the judge died, the people returned to their corrupt ways, behaving worse than those who had lived before them. They went after other gods, serving and worshiping them. And they refuse to give up their evil practices in stubborn ways. This is the cycle of redemption. And the rest of Judges plays across this stage, a real three-ring circus. Israel disobeys God. Israel is turned over to their enemies. God rescues his people. And so we come to Ehud, who is Israel's second judge. I'm sorry if you are bothered that I skipped over Othniel, um, but there you go. Um, that's it. That's it for Othniel's story. Um, so sorry for you, Othniel fans, um, but we are going to skip past him to Ehud, um, where the cycle starts again. Once again, the Israelites did evil in the Lord's sight, and the Lord gave King Eglon of Moab control over Israel because of their evil. Eglon enlisted the Ammonites and the Amalekites as allies, and then he went out and defeated Israel taking possession of Jericho, the city of Palms, and the Israelites served Eglon of Moab for 18 years. Eglon, king of Moab, he conquers Israel and he takes Jericho for his own city. The very first city that the Israelites ever conquered themselves in the promised land is now the seat of power for this occupying force. Now, as kings often do when they conquer other kingdoms, Eglon forces Israel to pay him tribute so as to further subjugate and control God's people. This tribute, however, also will provide opportunity for God to call Ehud as this story continues. But when the people of Israel cried out to the Lord for help, the Lord again raised up a rescuer to save them. His name was Ehud, son of Jerah, a left-handed man of the tribe of Benjamin. The Israelites sent Ehud to deliver the tribute money to King Eglon of Moab. So Ehud made a double-edged dagger that was about a foot long, and he strapped it to his right thigh. He kept it hidden under his clothing. He brought the tribute money to Eglon. 
As we turn our attention to the third ring, God has heard the cries of Israel and he rescues up a rescuer, raises up a rescuer, our story's hero, Ehud. And this passage tells us quite a bit about Ehud because, I mean, we already know a lot more about him than we know about his, pre- his predecessor. Um, first, Ehud is left-handed, which again, like today, is less common. Show of hands, who is left-handed here? Three out of, you know, I don't know, about 20 people. Second, we also know Ehud. He's from the tribe of Benjamin, which is convenient. That puts him near Jericho to begin with. Obviously, you're not going to send someone all the way from Asher for this task. Um, Just to drop off the king's gold. And finally, um, we know that Ehud has a 12-inch dagger that is strapped to his side and is hidden under his clothes. And this just seems like perfect for an assassination. Oh, and we get one more detail um, from the story for this in this section. Eglon was very fat. You can put that down like as a memory verse if you want. Um, Right now, it's kind of hard to say why is that relevant, but it's striking already how much more detail that Ehud's story is getting relative to Othniel's before it. And it's so much more detail than the judge after him, Shamgar, gets. Shamgar's story is told in one verse. And we kind of have to pause for a second and ask why. Why did the author of Judges consider Ehud's story worth paying so much attention to? After all, um, Shamgar, he killed 600 men with an ox goat. Now, though, as we get into Ehud's story, it is pretty crazy. It's diehard-esque action meets Game of Thrones level graphicness. Um, It makes for a pretty interesting story, as you will see, but that alone doesn't describe it. That doesn't explain it. Because the Bible isn't a book of entertainment, but it's a book of instruction and transformation. There is something more to learn from Ehud than just a good story. So let's continue through the rest of the story and let's pay attention to what the detail is trying to teach us. After delivering the payment, Ehud started home with those who had helped carry the tribute. But when Ehud reached the stone idols near Gilgal, he turned back. So quick pause, because I think that's a pretty interesting detail. Because Gilgal isn't a random place. And you might even recognize it if you've been reading Joshua recently. Because Gilgal is the place where, the, where God parted the Jordan River so that Joshua could lead Israel across and into the promised land. So this is a significant place for the Israelites. Um, and going back all the way to Abraham and even Noah before that, God's people would mark significant places with altars and stone memorials. And that's exactly what Joshua had the people do here at Gilgal. It was here at Gilgal that Joshua piled up the 12 stones taken from the Jordan River. Then Joshua said to the Israelites, in the future, your children will ask, what do these stones mean? Then you can tell them, this is where the Israelites crossed the Jordan on dry ground. For the Lord, your God dried up the river right before your eyes and he kept it dry until you all were across. Just as he did at the Red Sea when he dried it up until we had all crossed over. He did this so all the nations of earth might know that the Lord's hand is powerful and so that you might fear the Lord your God forever. Now, Judges says stone idols, not memorials. So I would think that these are something different than what Joshua had built. But where stone memorials for God's miracle at the Jordan were built now stand stone idols as well. Just an interesting detail, or is there something more to this? For now, though, let's return with Ehud to Jericho. He came to Eglon and said, I have a secret message for you. So the king commanded his servants, be quiet, and he sent them all out of the room. Ehud walked over to Eglon, who was sitting alone in the cool upstairs room, and Ehud said, I have a message from God for you. As King Eglon rose from his seat, Ehud reached with his left hand, pulled out the dagger strapped to his right thigh, and he plunged it into the king's belly. Eglon not Ehud, is our sword swallower. And that's a real diehard moment right there. Ehud pulls out the hidden weapon, strapped to his body, he delivers a wicked one-liner, and then he kills the bad guy. yippee ki Continuing on, 
the dagger went so deep that the handle disappeared beneath the king's fat. So Ehud did not pull out the dagger, and the king's bowels emptied. Then Ehud closed the lock and locked the doors of the room, and he escaped down the latrine. Pleasant. Uh, after Ehud was gone, the king's servants returned and found the doors to the upstairs room locked. They thought that he might be using the latrine in the room, so they waited. But when the king didn't come out after a long delay, they became concerned and they got a key. And when they opened the doors, they found their master dead on the floor. While the servants were waiting, he had escaped, passing the stone idols on his way to Sarai. When he arrived in the hill country of Ephraim, he had sounded the call to arms. Then he led a band of Israel down from the hills. Follow me, he said, for the Lord has given you victory over Moab, your enemy. So they followed him. And the Israelites took control of the shallow crossing of the Jordan River across from Moab, preventing anyone from crossing. And they attacked the Moabites and killed about 10,000 of their strongest and most able-bodied warriors. Not one of them escaped. Ehud snakes back. He gets a private audience with the king. He goes full diehard and he kills his enemy. Then he sneaks out of the city. He rallies the troops and he leads them to victory against the suddenly kingless Moabites. Ehud frees Israel. It's brave hearts, except the king, not William Wallace, gets disemboweled. What a great story. It's the story of a hero. But also what a weird story. There's many weird, odd details, especially about Eglon. Um, first of all, we know that he's fat. He's so fat that when Ehud stabs him and drives the dagger into him, it just gets completely lost in the fat. And then there's all that poop. Eglon's bowels just completely emptied. Um, and then the story tells us how his servants waited to enter the room because they thought he was relieving himself. I mean, they're not exactly wrong. Um, but then even just, I like the way the NIV says it. They waited to the point of embarrassment. Now, when Ehud has enough time to sneak out through the latrine, get out through the sewers, get out of the city, and return to Ephraim and rally the troops in all this time, and it takes that long before the servants finally decide, you know what, this is embarrassing. Like, I mean, it's, it's bad. bad. Like, it's bad, but like, Eglon doesn't normally take this long. I mean, in which case, like, how long though does Eglon normally take? Like, I'm gonna be honest. I'm checking in on Ryan after an hour, um, like tops. And I, I hope he can kind of do the same thing for me. But Ehud, he obviously had a lot more than an hour in order to get us out of the city and as far as he did. And I'm not saying this to be gross because let's be honest, judges took care of that. But I'm saying it because I kind of think it's hard to say that a carefully crafted assassination plot hinged on the king's track record for lengthy bowel movements. And if you knew that the king had lengthy bowel movements and that was your plan, then would you also escape through the toilet? Like, like if you knew all these details, like this doesn't strike me as like a carefully crafted plan. And it makes me start to question the narrative where Ehud is the hero, this John McClane mixed with William Wallace. Now, the thing is, Judges never tells us that this is the case to begin with. It never tells us that Ehud has a plan. We want to read into it. We want to um, paint this picture of a shrewd assassin carrying out a carefully laid plot to kill the king and to lead an army in a battle for freedom. But we need to be careful to not make the story more than what it is. And that's not necessarily the story is be that's being told. So let's look back. What does Judges actually tell us? Well, Judges tells us that Ehud is left-handed, and he's carrying a dagger hidden under his clothes. Now, that detail sounds like a real kind of revealing the secret plan of Ehud's, but while we like to assume that this is all part of a brewing assassination plot, 
The author of Judges doesn't tell us that. It just tells us that he made this dagger when he was sent to carry gold to a foreign king in enemy territory. Carrying a lot of money into enemy territory sounds like a pretty good reason to pack heat. And then the fact that he was left-handed to help, you know, that may have helped him hide the dagger because typically it would, it would have been strapped, you know, daggers would be strapped to the, to the left side and you can pull it out with your right hand. But, and that kind of helped Eglon not really realize what Ehud, would, Ehud was up to when he reached to his right. But just that he used that to his advantage doesn't tell us that that was his plan. Then there's um, Ehud turning back after passing the stone idols at Gilgal. Again, we could just assume that this was just his plan so that he could go back to the king alone and not with the others that were helping deliver the gold. But we aren't told that. And again, like no detail is insignificant. Because what we do know, because what the Bible actually does tell us is that this is the place where the Israelites crossed the Jordan into the promised land. Joshua had memorials built here to remind future generations of God's deliverance of his people. He did this so all the nations of the earth might know that the Lord's hand is powerful and so that you might fear the Lord your God forever. This is a significant place of remembrance for the Israelites. And it was after passing this place, now marked with foreign idols, that Ehud turned back. Was this a part of the plan or was he reminded of God's power and deliverance contrasted with these idols of foreign gods? and then and there felt God's call to obey and follow him back to Jericho. Judges doesn't tell us either way, but what it does tell us from here on out is a story that is incredibly absurd and incredibly fortunate for Ehud. Without every detail from King Eglon's Eglon's on health to his acceptance of a private meeting to his servant's patience for the king's privacy in the bathroom, all of these details not being anything that Ehud could have controlled or planned for. If none of these played out exactly as they did, Ehud is not pulling off the deliverance of God's people. There's no a, there's no a team moment here. You know, I love it when a plan comes together. I mean, this is either incredible luck or something else. So instead of the picture of a shrewd assassin carrying out a carefully laid plot to kill the king and lead an army in a battle for freedom, the many many seemingly random and or gross details, I say, point us instead to a story of God using a man who finds himself in the right place at the right time with the right peculiarity, who is reminded of God's covenant with his people who succeeds through a series of events that could only be laid out by God to kill the king, to escape, and to get just enough time to run home and rile the troops. We can look at all the weird and all the gory details in this story as nothing more than just creative writing setting up an interesting story, or as the miraculous events through which God, not Ehud, delivered Israel. And as we explore Judges the rest of the summer, we're going to find that that narrative is a lot more consistent with the rest of Judges and with the rest of the Bible. It's going to be a familiar refrain throughout the rest of this book. God is the deliverer. God is the hero. God rescues his people. And it is he who should receive all of the glory. Not Ehud, not us. But the story does also remind us that while it is God's story that he wants us to be a part of it, not just as the beloved to be rescued, but as part of the rescue team, not just, and while God may have been the ultimate deliverer from King Eglon and the Moabites, Ehud, and who God uniquely designed him to be was key to the story. God used Ehud's left-handedness, a quirk that would leave him overlooked and unsuspected. God used his origin as a Benjamite because it put him on the team delivering the tribute. But most importantly, God used his willingness. Ehud chose to turn around. He chose to return to his enemy, 
to request a private meeting and to pull out the dagger strapped to his white right side and to drive it into the king. When God reminded Ehud of his mighty power, love, and deliverance of, e of Israel, Ehud chose to be a part of the story. He was willing. And when we are willing to use our unique gifts and design, when we are willing to follow God wherever he may lead us, even if it's into the enemy's stronghold, we too choose to be a part of the story. So as we depart from this story of Ehud and Eglon, let's take away a couple of things. First, the importance of remembrance. Israel, I mean, got into trouble as generations forgot God. However, here we see the tradition of throughout, that we see throughout the Old Testament of people building memorials and altars in places where they encountered God to remind them of God's covenant, of his miracles, of his power, his deliverance, or of his love. Noah, Abraham, Jacob, Moses, they all built memorials before Joshua built one at Gilgal on the shores of the Jordan River. With Ehud, we have returned to Gilgal, which was marked as the place where God brought his people into the promised land. It is the place where Ehud turned back to Jericho. Like the Israelites, so that we don't forget, we too need to have reminders of God's promises, of his power, and of his love. Reminders of who God says we are and who he calls us to be. So that when things are tough or challenging, we have those reminders to help guide us back onto the path of God, like the memorials at Gilgal for Ehud. That's why it's so important to study and, and memorize verses so that you have them to call upon and remind you of God's word in times of need. Now, I grew up being assigned memory verses all throughout my time at my Christian grade school. And I remember precisely zero verses from that time. Instead, the verses that I remember are ones that I found from personal reading of the Bible or messages on Sunday mornings or were given to me by a friend when I needed it. They're verses that God spoke especially through at that point in my journey, and they stuck with me. They remind me of who God says I am. They remind me of his careful design of my gifts and calling. And they remind me of his great love for me. So I encourage all of you to dive into the Bible and find some verses for yourself. Um, but to, hear, to get you started, here are a few suggestions. Um, one of my fa personal favorite memory verses is Ephesians 2.10. For we are God's masterpiece. He has created us anew in Christ Jesus so that we could do the good things he planned for us long ago. There's another one that's the classic gospel in a nutshell, John 3.16 to 17. For this is how God loved the world. He gave his one and only son so that everyone who believes in him will not perish but have eternal life. God sent his son into the world not to judge the world but to save the world through him. Uh, for an Old Testament recommendation, try Isaiah 46, 3 to 4. Listen to me, you descendants of Jacob, all the remnant of the people of Israel, you whom I have upheld since your birth and have carried since you were born. Even to your old age and gray hairs, I am he, I am he who will sustain you. I have made you and I will carry you. I will sustain you and I will rescue you. Again, these are just some suggestions. But I really do encourage everyone to take some time to choose a verse, to study it, to learn its context, to understand its promises, and then to memorize it so that you can call upon it on a time when you need a reminder of God's word. Second, um, embrace who God made you to be. God made you exactly as he meant to. As Psalm 139, another recommendation for memorizing, by the way, tells us, you made all the delicate inner parts of my body, and you knit me together in my mother's womb. Thank you for making me so wonderfully complex. Your workmanship is marvelous. How well I know it. Ehud had to be exactly who he was. A left-handed man from the tribe of Benjamin to play his role in the story. What set him apart equipped him especially for the task. His family and home put him in the right place to act. If we are to be all who God made us to be, we have to fully embrace who we are. We have to integrate all of our quirks, our past, our perceived weakness and struggle into how we see ourselves. 
If we deny any part of ourselves, we deny God from using it. Take some time this week to start working on integrating the parts of you that you struggle with, that you try to deny or hide. It may be your family. It may be a physical weakness. It may be an addiction. It could be something that you've done in the past. Whatever it is, good or bad, start the process of of looking at it and really consider how it is a part of you and take the steps to integrate it into your perception of yourself because it's all a part of you. If you need to see counseling to work through this process, that's okay. If you need someone to talk to, reach out. Just start something this week. Because when God calls you, he needs all of you, just as he did with Ehud. And now the story of Ehud, the left-handed man, and Eglon, the sword swallower, and it comes to an end. So Moab was conquered by Israel that day, and there was peace in the land for 80 years. God rescues his people, and there is peace. Israel is delivered. But after 80 years, the cycle begins again. And the next act enters the Three Ring Circus. The cycle of redemption, it closes and begins with God's rescue, then and always. The story of Ehud reminds us of that, that it's God's story. It's always God's story. It's his story of constantly pursuing his people, his nation, his church, and his beloved. We will screw up, we will disobey, we will run away, but God will always love us, always forgive us, and always take us back. And we will hear this story time and time again this summer. Israel sins, Israel falls, God rescues his people. And every time you hear it this summer, let the truth of God's boundless love, his infinite grace sink deeper and deeper. Every time you find yourself in one of the misfits, another one of the circus acts, listen to God calling you, all of you, all of who you are, to join in his story. Every time the cycle repeats itself then, realize one more truth. The cycle doesn't repeat anymore because Jesus took up the cross and he declared, it is finished. No judge will ever be raised up again. No more, de- no more deliverers will come. No matter how many times we fail, the final judge came and he took our place before the enemy. And rather than slay the evil king, he sacrificed himself. Through Jesus' death and resurrection, we have been redeemed once and for all. And the cycle has been broken. Please pray with me. Dear Heavenly Father, I thank you for your redemption. I thank you for your love. I thank you that no matter that just the constant rescue of your people time and time again, the love you show throughout the Old Testament for your people, that every time they sin and fall away, Lord, that you still pursued them, you still rescued them, and you still saved them, Lord. I thank you that you sent the ultimate Savior who ended the cycle once and for all, Lord. I pray you guide us as we go out from here, Lord, and we learn to memorize, learn some verses, internalize those verses, Lord, so that we have those to remember you and your power and your glory and your grace, Lord. And I pray as we work to integrate all of who are yourselves, Lord, and to, that you just walk us through those processes, Lord, so that that when you call us, Lord, that we are ready and we are present. Um, Thank you for the story of Ehud, Lord, what we may learn from, and I pray that we take that with us this week. Um, So I thank you. In your holy name I pray. Amen.